Thanks. Okay. So, yeah, the job of the high priest was to was to um, make sure the lamp was filled with oil. And in John 8, 12, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Those that follow me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. Jesus is declaring that as high priest, he's going to prepare the way, fulfill the job that the high priest did, paying for the sins of the nation or the world. And Jesus said, when I'm finished with my work, the Holy Spirit will come and he will permanently indwell you with, your, with, with his light. And, but also in Matthew 5, 14, Jesus told his disciples that you, you are the light of the world. So you're a city on the hill. So in Christ, we have the light of God shining through us, the light of the Holy Spirit. And Pentecost, of course, was about the fact that God's Holy Spirit now permanently indwells his bride, his church. And this now fulfills the requirement that the, um, the candlesticks be always filled with oil. Verse five, you shall, you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes thereof. Two tenths deal shall be in one cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row upon the pure table before the Lord. Again, this is the, the showbread. Exodus 24, 30 told them to make the showbread and gave them some instructions, but this is further details. Um, the 12 loaves represent the 12 tribes. And of course, um, the, this was the, the 12 tribes being represented before the priests, but the priests would eat this and it was supposed to be part of their sustenance. And it says here, and you shall put frankincense upon each row that it may be on the bread for memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And again, we're gonna see this uh, frankincense as a symbol of deity. Frankincense is a, a symbol of, um, of priesthood. And just to go back in a few days with Christmas, we talk about the nativity scene. We talked about the Magi and the Magi brought gold, frankincense and myrrh. And um, I'm convinced that they were fully aware of the significance of this. They were coming to worship God incarnate. They knew their scriptures from Daniel, if not, any, some, if not elsewhere, at least Daniel would have taught them all these things. And they were coming to acknowledge the Messiah who was going to be both priest and king. They brought gold to acknowledge his king's kingship. They brought frankincense to acknowledge his priesthood and his divinity. And they brought myrrh because they knew he would be cut off at some point as Daniel taught them. So myrrh was an embalming um, ointment and for, used for embalming. So in, in the chapter in the verse seven here, frankincense, a reminder that Jesus is the bread of life. The Messiah was gonna be the bread of life. He was going to be a high priest. And it says, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Verse eight, every Sabbath, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Once again, the the children of Israel are providing this. They're bringing in showbread. They're bringing in materials, uh, ingredients for this. The priests have to set it up on the table and, and they, they eat it, but they have to make sure that it is renewed every Sabbath. It is a brand new. Once again, uh, the priests had to do something on a weekly basis or a periodic basis to make sure it was always there. Jesus Christ comes along and offers this stuff offers himself permanently. We have permanent bread of life. Um, we're promised that we eat the body and drink the blood. This is a communion. Um, this is also part of the, the, the peace offering in a sense, because that was also a meal to be enjoyed together. This is communion and fellowship. In verse nine, and it shall be Aaron and Aaron's sons 
That means the priests are going to eat this. This is for them to eat. And they shall eat it in the holy place. It must be eaten right there. Uh, the holy place is where fellowship with God begins. Ultimate fellowship is in the Holy of Holies, but the holy place, this is where the, the candlesticks are. This is where the bread is. So we have God's Holy Spirit. We have the bread of life and the incense of prayers. And this is where we begin to meet and fellowship with God. Now, if you recall, even getting into the tabernacle meant coming through the one door. You go through the one door of the, tab the gate. It is the one entrance in the, the tent surrounding the tabernacle. You must come in through that gate and that gate alone. You have to pass by the, off, um, the altar, the, the, the burnt offering altar, the sin offering altar. So it must be paid for and atonement must be done. And then you are allowed to enter in. And of course the priests went through all of this at that time. <clears throat> So this, this portion right now was just a clarification on the light and the showbread. So now we have something that seems to interrupt. It's a, a little story, an example. And um, apparently something happens that's brought to Moses' attention and he's asked, how do we deal with this? What's the process? And this is a very good thing because the people are being taught that there is there is a rule, there's laws to follow, there's um, protocols to follow in different situations, and they no longer can just take it upon themselves. In other words, you can't have mobs deciding what happens in situations. You can't have groups of people taking the law under their own hands, though they're trying to do the right thing and they bring the situation to Moses. Verse 11, it says, and an Israelite woman, son, blasphemed. I'm back, verse 10, sorry. And the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelite woman and the man of Israel strove together in the camp. So we have a man, two men fighting. One of the men is, you know, ethnically half Jewish. It kind of looks like his father's not even there. We do know that when Israel left, Egypt, they came out, Exodus 12, 30, it says it was a mixed multitude. So we know there were non-Jewish people in the group. There were Egyptians that apparently accepted um, the suggestion to put blood on the door, doorpost. There were Egyptians that said, this must be the true God. We're going to follow him and his people. They were fully accepted and God gave commands to honor and protect um, foreigners and people that were not Jewish, it, um, they were expected to allow anybody to become Jewish and to accept the Jewish faith and treat them as equals. Um, but in this case, this is a son, I guess it looks like his Egyptian father's not there. But um, these are gonna be two grown men that are fighting. These are men that are above any age of accountability. And they're fighting together, verse 11, and the Israel, Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. So he cursed God. He cursed Yahweh. He said something bad about God. And they brought him to Moses. The mother's name was Sholemeth, the daughter of Debris in the tribe of Dan. Okay. And they put him in ward. That means they, they, they constrained him. They, they, I can't say they locked him up. They didn't really have jails. We'll talk about that later. But they just said, we don't know what to do with him. We're going to just um, set him aside for right now and went to, went to Moses. And what do we do? And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, bring forth him that cursed outside the camp. Let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head and let all the congregation stone him. So this is obviously very serious. Now, cursing God for this way. In ancient, in, in ancient Egypt, they had lots and lots of gods. And people got mad at different gods, and it actually was not uncommon to get mad at somebody and curse the god that that person liked. You know, your god's an idiot. My god's better than your god. Infighting was, was common, and this could easily have been what happened. 
And what possibly would anger God more than anything else is that he was being treated like those other gods. You know, I'm not one of your everyday gods that were in Egypt. I'm not one of your everyday Canaanite gods. I'm above all of those gods. And to, from, to be familiar with me is a, a, a violation of the commandments that I've already given. And God chose, chooses to use this as an example. We saw the, he set examples with Aaron's sons. Um, in the New Testament, he set examples with Ananias and Sapphira. And it says, it tells him to bring forth, verse 15, you shall speak to the children of Israel and say, whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. If you're old enough to know better and you decide you're going to provide a curse, you're going to consciously oppose God and, and, and curse him, say that he is, you know, not holy, say he's not fair, say he's, He's evil. They shall bear that sin. Verse 16, he that blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And all, all the congregation shall certainly stone him. So the congregation that stones him, remember in Deuteronomy 17, 6 to 7, the witnesses, people that actually heard, eyewitness, earwitnesses, have to be the ones to throw the first stone. This is what Jesus reminded the Pharisees of when they brought him the woman caught in the act of adultery. There is no mob stoning in the law. You bring the person to the judge. The judge decides whether it is a capital offense or not. In this case, it brought him towards Moses, and God told him what to do. But then the person bringing the accusation has to throw the stone. and. Um, this creates a severity. The punishment can be very severe. The person throwing the stone can feel like they're being punished. And in fact, the community can feel like we're all paying the price for this. It creates a somber attitude and a deterrent attitude, not a mob attitude. We can see when this, when this thinking is not followed, we have a mob attitude of Oh, let's string them up or let's, you know, let them burn, let them fry. It's easy for the crowd to say that. Not so easy for the person that actually saw it happen to have to carry it, carry it out. So um, Moses um, provides a little extra clarification here. God does. Verse 17, he that kills a man shall surely be put to death. This is a... Uh, reaffirmation of the death penalty for murder. Verse 18, he that kills a beast, beast shall make it good, beast for beast. So according to this, killing an animal is not as great a crime as killing a person. Um, some people in America might think differently about that, but you kill an animal, you have to recompense. Everything is restitution. Verse 19, if a man causes a blemish in his neighbor, as he has done, so shall it be done to him. A breach for a breach. You, know, you cut somebody, you get cut. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, as he has caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. This is the principle of restitution. And a lot of people think that this idea of eye for an eye is a command. In other words, if you put out my eye, I must put out your eye. But it is actually a limitation. This is telling the judges that when someone comes before you and they had, then somebody broke somebody's arm, you cannot punish the person more than breaking, breaking his arm. Punishments can be given up to, but not beyond the severity of the crime. The punishment must fit the crime. So we have eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Once again, this is justice. Vengeance belongs to God. Any punishment that exceeds the crime is punitive. It is vengeance according to God. And there's no place for it in the criminal code. Um, you know, punitive damage is to try to teach people lessons in maybe other ways, but the whole eye for an eye was designed to tell the surrounding nations that we do things orderly. We're not barbarians. It was a, it was, it's barbarous to say, you know, you, you hurt my son, I must kill your family. This is what the 
other kingdoms practiced at that time. Verse 21, he that kills a beast shall restore it. He that kills a man, he shall be put to death. You should have one manner of law as well for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. And Moses spake to the children of Israel that they should bring forth him that had cursed out of the camp and stoning him with stones. And the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. So the clarification for capital offense is given. We're told that this is a one law for everybody. We don't have different laws for different groups of people. That's known as apartheid. When you have one law for one group, another law for another group. When you have one law for the politician and one law for the common man, that's for, for, forbidden. One law for the rich, one law for the poor, that's forbidden. One law for one group, a different law for a different ethnic group, that's forbidden. One law for everybody. And this first, last verse here lets us know that the law is serious. It's not something to just think about and philosophize over. It's not something to um, contemplate. It's not just suggestions. This is the rules for a civilized society. And um, God is serious about that. One, uh, <clears throat> one little step back here on the idea of blasphemy, the crime of blasphemy. Um, the Jews were given the name of God, Yahweh. And because of fear of blasphemy, they decided never ever to say the name. I can't blaspheme, I can't take the name in vain if I don't say it, right? They actually tried never, never to write it. They would write, even today, they write the word God with a capital G dash D. Um, if you write out the name of God and something happens to that piece of paper, well, that obviously is profaning his name. Um, they, will call, they will call God Hashem, meaning his name or the name, to avoid saying his name. And it's interesting that the people who were entrusted with how God really pronounces his name lost it because of that. Uh, we can see those four letters that the um, tetragrammaton, that is those four letters that uh, that don't give us the vowels. So Yahweh, Yahweh, possible. Um, the Latin perversion is Jehovah, making a J out of that. So, I mean, I, I personally avoid the word Jehovah. I just prefer Yahweh, but that's a personal preference. So. Chapter 25, and the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. So this apparently happened earlier. Because up till, you know, after the tabernacle, God's speaking to them from the tabernacle. But what we see here is a, a larger explanation of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, what a Sabbath means. We had the Sabbath day. Now we're going to see what the Sabbath year is here. So. It says, speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I gave you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So the land's going to have its own Sabbath. The word Sabbath simply means rest. And a Sabbath means a rest of one seventh. I'm going to say it that way because the Sabbath day is the seventh day that one rests. Okay. And this is a, a law of when you come into the land. Let's remember, while they're around Mount Sinai and they're getting the law and they're getting the tabernacle up and running and everything is being taught and understanding, in their minds, even in Moses' mind, they have no reason not to believe that they're going to be heading to the promised land in a few months. They don't know they're going to be held up for 40 years. They think, well, as soon as we get this down and established, it's going to be time to go in. And in fact, they could have. And we know how they, they, it didn't happen. But they're saying, you're going to keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years shall you sow the field, and six years you prune the vineyard and gather the fruit thereof. But the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall neither sow nor prune your vineyard. That's what That which grows of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap. Neither gather the grapes of the vine undressed, for it is a year of rest to the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you for you and for your servant, for your maid, for your hired servants, for your stranger that sojourns with thee and for your cattle and beasts that are in the land so all the increase thereof be meat. So this is saying you plant your crops for six years 
In the seventh year, you don't touch the land. You don't work the land. Um, if you recall, they were told to wait four years before they started crops. They wanted things to have its rest. And God is setting up a system whereby the land gets a rest. Every, every six years, the land gets to rest. Now, this is good agricultural practice. And even today, we do crop rotation and things like that. But what God is setting up here is a system of trust. Let's think of it like a tithe, okay? God is saying, if you don't work the land every seven years, I'm going to take care of you. And if you don't trust, I'll take care of you. Go ahead and work that seventh year when you're on your own. But if you trust me and leave the land to rest for that seventh year, I'll take care of you. And later on in this chapter, we see more details of that. This is a declaration of dependency on God. They're saying that God is going to take care of us. Um, a lot of people didn't do this. This led to problems. But um, a lot of, uh, even today, Jewish farmers sometimes will sell their land to a Gentile for one year. And then they'll work on the Gentiles' land, and then they'll buy it back. And, or they'll take portions of their land and give each portion a break and have like a little seven-year cycle go up throughout their land, which, of course, defeats the purpose. Um, but this, this idea is to say seven years, every seventh year is a rest. Now, obviously, there's going to be random crops that grow on their own. And you can't go out and work to harvest it. You can't go out and dress the vineyard. You can't do any work on your land. However, it says it'll be meat for you. But this means that everybody has access to the wild growth. People that gleaners, the, the servants, the poor, all these people are free to kind of roam the land and you know, clean up, do whatever they need, things that grow wild. Again, you can't harvest, you can't go out there and hoe the ground, you can't go out there and weed it, you can't um, dress and, and you know, trim the vines, everything has to be all natural in a sense. And that was allowed <clears throat> to be meat for the people and God would take care of them. We have this, another section here now. It says, verse eight, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee. So a Sabbath of years is seven years and seven of those is 49 years. Seven times seven years and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee 49 years. See, the Bible can do math. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. In the day of the torment shall you make trumpet sound throughout all your land and you shall hallow the 50th year. You follow the seven year cycle and after seven of those you have an extra year. On the 50th year, you have another Sabbath year. And this Sabbath year is a very special year. You hallow this 50th year. Something very special happens on the 50th year. It says, you proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession and return every man unto his family. The idea here is that property in Israel is never fully owned. It is owned by the tribe, and you're welcome to lease the property to other people, but at the 50 year mark, it goes back to the original person. And we'll see how the compensation works for that. It is a means of actually um, addressing poverty. It's a means of making sure land stays in the family. It, it's not socialism in any way because it's it, we're not redistributing land, we're maintaining land integrity. Um, <clears throat> verse 11, Jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not sow nor reap. That's what grows of itself in it. Neither gather the grapes and the vine undressed. It is a jubilee, holy unto you. You shall eat the increase there out of your, out of your field. So you are allowed to in, you know, eat what grows again. It's a special Sabbath year. And you know it could be two in a row, depending on how it works out. Um, this phrase of liberty throughout the land is, of course, in Isaiah 61, when Christ, one of his first messages mentioned that. 
We also see that phrase on the Liberty Bell in America, in, in Philadelphia. <clears throat> but it's the idea of property redemption, okay? So here's how it works, verse 15. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor, and according to the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell unto thee. So the value of the land was basically how many years of crops you could have on it. If I purchase land from you five years after a Jubilee year, it's worth 45 years of crops. It's a good price. I mean, it could cost a good deal of money. If I purchase land from you five years before the next Jubilee, it's only worth five years of crops and the price is going to be reduced accordingly. And it says, Verse 16, according to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price of it. For according to the number of years of fruits, does he sell unto you. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another. This removes debt oppression. Debt is a horrible oppression. Uh, we know that um, Proverbs 22 7 says, the rich rule over the poor. And the borrower is slave to the lender. This is a fact of life. It's a fact of economics. It's something that people don't like. The rich rule. There are a lot of people like to get rid of that. It's true. Part of the American experiment was to say, well, since the rich are going to rule, let's go ahead and have the rich be those that provide services and businesses and help their fellow men. They didn't want the rich to be the kings and queens. They didn't want the rich to be the blue bloods. They wanted the rich to be people that were contributing. Um, it's part of the experiment, but they knew the rich, rich were gonna rule anyway. I'd much rather have the rich in my country be the ones that provide goods and services and help other people and benefit rather than the ones that play political games and you know, are like monarchies. That was part of the idea there. You're never gonna get over the fact that the rich rule. It just, I, I would just prefer a much nicer category, a quality of rich people in charge. And the le ne next part, the borrower is slave. The borrower is always a slave. You are a slave to the person you borrow from. That can't be changed. The Jubilee year though, removed all debts. As we'll see here, it says, therefore, as a result, you will not oppress one another, but you shall fear, the, fear thy God, for I am the Lord thy God. I want us to picture what would happen right now in America if every single debt was totally forgiven, every debt. Some economists are trying to study this out. Would it result in crazy chaos? In a way, yes. But if every debt was suddenly just declared paid, everything is reset to zero. Could you function that way? Could you say, well, okay, all that money that's owed me, think about how much money is owed to you right now. And you go, okay, I'm never gonna see that money again. Well, maybe you won't anyway, right? <laughs> but think of the money you do owe and that suddenly is not owed anymore. But what if all the mortgages, all the banks keep going up and up, the money owed to you know, treasuries, the money owed to other countries. If the debt will kind of reset, it might not be a bad thing. And if you knew every 50 years that was going to happen, you know, it's, it's something that could, you know, be something to think about. What type of blessing could that bring if it's something that's done on a regular basis? God says, wherefore you shall do my statutes, verse 18, and keep my judgment and do them. You shall dwell in the land safely. And the land shall yield her fruit and you shall eat your fill and dwell there safe. So he's now going back talking about the Sabbath years. Um, he goes back and forth between Sabbath years and Jubilee. Sabbath years, he reminds them. Verse 20, and you might say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Good question, right? Behold, we're not gonna sow nor gather increase. God says, then I command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years, and you shall sow the eighth year, and eat of the old fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, shall eat 
of the old store. God is saying, if you trust me for that seventh year, I'm going to cover you. This reminds me of the manna. Don't take more than you need. I'll get to the next day. Um, to make sure you don't work on the Sabbath, I'll give you enough for the next day on that one year. Again, we have the same principle with tithing. Tithing is not law. People say tithing is under the law. I say no, because if I don't tithe, I'm still going to heaven. So not tithing will not send me to hell. Therefore, it's not the law. But it was a principle given to Melchizedek long before the law. And it's an option. I can choose to live off in 90%, give God 10, and God's promise to bless me, sustain me, and keep me. And I think most people that have practiced tithing realize that 90% goes further than 100%. It's my experience. That's most people's experience. Um, <clears throat> just so to continue on here. Now back to Jubilee details. The land should not be sold forever. For the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. This is divine feudalism. Under feudalism with kings, the king owns all the land. Even today, Queen Elizabeth owns all the land in Great Britain. She lets people use it. She leases it out. But technically, she owns the land. And that's what most kings do. And God is telling the Israelites, I'm your king. The land is mine. I'm letting you use it. And you can lease it to other people, but I decide because God is going to, when they go to the promised land, declare the tracts of land each tribe gets. He's going to give them. He says, verse 24, in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption of the land. So some benefits of our um, uh, jubilee year. If your brother be poor and has sold some of his possession, if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem which his brother has sold. And if no man, if the man has none to redeem it, he himself shall be able to redeem it. This is the redeemer, a kinsman redeemer we saw in Ruth. When, when Boaz went to Naomi's kinsman redeemer, he said, we need some money. And we'd like to sell some of the land back to you. What he's saying is, if you wait to the Jubilee year, you're going to get it anyway. But um, if you want it earlier, you can buy it. You can purchase it back from us now and get your land back earlier. And the Kinsman Redeemer thought it was a good idea until he realized Ruth came with it. And he declined, at which point Boaz took over. And verse 27 is how it works. Let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it. And he returned unto him. Once again, the value of the property, it gets less and less as the year of Jubilee comes along because there's less crop opportunity for that. If he's not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold to remain in the hand of him that has brought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the Jubilee, it shall go out and he shall return to his possession. So a couple of exceptions. If a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, that he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year, may he redeem it. And if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it throughout the generations. It shall not go out in a jubilee year. Urban real estate is not part of the jubilee deal. Urban real estate is not a place you can have crops. So if you buy a house in a walled city, it's yours. That stays forever. Um, the walled city is not going to be moving anywhere. The walled city still is part of that tribe. But the, the, the house you buy there, the house you build there, the things that happen in urban real estate are exempt from the Jubilee. In terms of property, obviously debts and prisoners set free. Again, your Jubilee, all servants are set free. All prisoners set free. Remember, prison was not part of the, uh, the judicial system in the, under the law. You didn't go to prison for crimes. This one guy was held just for a little bit until they decided what to do with him. Prison does not exist. There's only two options for, or three options for a crime. One is restitution, two is death, and three is forgiveness. There's no prison at all in there. And there's a lot of people like... Um, 
who was the 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 Christian person got saved in prison under President Nixon. He did a lot of um, prison reform, and he was very focused on that. He says prisons dehumanize, and if we were to use a more biblical approach, perhaps we wouldn't have prison being the answer for everything. I mean, prisons were Roman things. They weren't Jewish things at all. So verse 31, but the houses of the villages which do not have walls around them are recounted as the fields of the country and they may, may, be, may, may be redeemed and they should go out in the Jubilee. So houses, buildings outside of walled cities must go back to original tribes, original families. Verse, verse 32, notwithstanding the cities of the Levites and the houses of the city of their possessions, may the Levites redeem at any time. If a man purchases the Levites, then the house that was sold and the city of possession shall go out in the year of Jubilee, for the houses of the cities of Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. Levites retain, Levites don't have land of their own. Levites are supposed to live in the other tribal areas. So any houses they do have always go back to them. But the fields of the suburbs of their cities may not be sold. It's a perpetual possession. So Levitical um, cities and lands, the suburb areas, they remain in Levite control as well. If your brother is poor and falls in de decay with you, then you shall relieve him. Even though he's a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with you. This is what happens. You're poor. You say, I need some money. Well, I can sell back some land. I can sell back whatever I have right now and get some money for that. This is what Ruth and Naomi did. Verse 36, take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God. These are instructions for lending to the poor. Sometimes some people think that the Bible prohibits interest or usury. And usury means extreme interest. Not really. It just simply means that when you're doing charity work, you're, you're not allowed to do interest. I can't lend money to the poor and charge them interest. I can lend money to someone who needs money to borrow and charge interest to them for business or you know, for whatever. But if I'm, if I'm helping the poor, I shouldn't be in it to make money. Okay? Thou shalt not give him the money upon usury or lend him victuals for increase. In other words, I see a poor person, he needs, he needs food. And I go and I find some food and I sell it to him for a profit. I don't take advantage of someone's misfortune to make money. Now, making money, we all know, is a wonderful, godly thing. You offer services and products for people in exchange for money. But don't do it and pretend you're um, in the charity business. Sometimes you know, I like watching Shark Tank. And sometimes you see someone who says, I got this great product and I'm making this much money and I'm giving a certain percentage to the poor, which is fine. That's their business. But a lot of times the sharks will ask them, is this a business or a charity? And it's, it's kind of tricky to try to mix the two. We have a culture that likes to think that you are supposed to. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, one of the best ways to help the poor is you go out and make your millions and then help the poor. That's one of the purposes for business is to create, you know, to, to be wealthy and a godly wealthy person. If God calls you to that, it needs to be a, call, a calling like anything else. So <clears throat> once again, God reminds them, verse 30, I am the Lord, your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and be your God. Once again, I made you and I bought you in your mind. If your brother that dwells with you become poor and is sold unto thee, you shall not compel him to serve as a bond servant. Okay. In other words, I'm not going to take advantage of a poor person. This was something that was happening. It technically wasn't called slavery in the time of Amos, but they were charging crazy prices to people and causing them to go in debt because of this. The best example I can think of is in America after slavery was abolished we started having something called sharecroppers. A person that used to work on the plantation as a slave, 
which of course is totally against anything in the Bible. This is kidnapping, is compulsory involuntary servitude. Nothing biblical about it. But when that was about, I said, okay, we'll pay you. And we'll pay you, we'll pay you room and board, we'll take care of you. And what they started doing was they would take um, the cost of doing business out of their paycheck. They go get, go get their paycheck into the week and they say, well, we owe you 20 bucks. The big number, I'm making it up. He says, but you broke a shovel, so that's 15 and you, uh, um, you used up too much water in your residence and that's another 10. So you now owe us, you now owe us 15 bucks. And it was designed to keep a person under permanent debt. And of course, when you're holding the fact that you live, I, I, I maintain your room and board for you, this, this is evil. And this is what this is talking about here. You don't take the principle of bond servant and use it to oppress somebody and keep them poor. It says, as a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you, he shall serve you to the year of Jubilee. So let's say you're some wicked person that does this. Well, you can't do it for long. What the year of Jubilee does is it, it puts an end to generational debt. Okay. I might be wicked. I might be an oppressor. I might keep you and your family under debt. I might be twisting the law for an advantage. When Jubilee shows up and it's over. Jubilee, I, I have to just count my losses, set people free. And they shall depart from you, both he and his children with him. Verse 41, and shall return to his own family. And the possession of his father shall he return. So that person, he could be from a different tribe or different family, but at the year of Jubilee, he gets to go back to them and perhaps he may find he has land to reclaim. He may find he has possessions to reclaim. Because, verse 42, they are my servants. Ultimately, God is saying, you do your business, you follow my laws, but at the end, it's my people and my land. I call the shots. This is God declaring his sovereignty. And he looks at everybody today and says, well, this is my planet and you're my creation. And God has the right and authority to decide how he's going to deal with that. And we have a time coming in our tribulation period when God is going to reclaim his planet and reclaim his people. We've talked about that in depth. <clears throat> 43, and you shall not rule over him with rigor. You shall fear thy God. This puts a ban on cruel, cruel taskmasters, cruel bosses. You know, if you're the boss of somebody, you have employers, well, you don't own them. Even if they're working off a of debt, you don't own them. You have obligations to them. Remember, if you go back to the very beginning of the law in, in, in Exodus 21, instructions on how to treat servants, on how to treat women, protection for animals, protection for, um, debtors and that's what this section is talking about how to properly deal with debt verse 44 both thy bondmen and thy bondsmaids which thou have shall be of heathen that are round about you of them you shall buy bondsmen and bondswomen moreover the children of strangers that do sojourn with, sojourn with you of them you shall buy and of their families that are with you which they begat in your land and they shall be your possession so this is allowing it's allowing servants from war eventually, but these are all rules when you get to the promised land. When you get to the promised land, you will, there will be people who are not Jewish, do not want to become Jews, to accept the faith, and you can hire them, you can work with them, you can, they can be bond servants, even them you don't own. It says, you'll take them as an inheritance for your children after you, inherit them for a possession, be a bondsman forever, but over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. So a foreigner could be a permanent bond slave. And this rubs people the wrong way, but even that bond slave had the option of accepting the God of Israel. We will see this in the millennial reign. There's portions in Ezekiel that talk about the fact that the Gentiles will be doing all the servant work. Gentiles will be the janitors in the, in the new millennium in Israel. And part of it, God says, is payback. 
There are going to be countries that mistreated the Jews, and for that thousand years, they're going to be enjoying the blessings and benefits of God on earth, peace, prosperity. But um, there's going to, be, going to be paying off some debts. Um, there's going to be punishments at the judgment of nations in Jehoshaphat, where um, there are going to be additional penalties that those nations are going to be economic sanctions on some of those countries that abused and hurt the Jewish people. <clears throat> so, if a sojourner or a stranger wax rich because of you, and that brother that dwell by him wax poor, and sell himself to the stranger or sojourner or to the stock of the stranger's family, after he has sold, he may be redeemed again. So you could, as a stranger, foreigner, who has not accepted the faith could become wealthy on their own for business. And they can go ahead and do a bond servant deal as well. But they're encouraged here to, if that happens, find a kinsman and redeem him as soon as you can. Get him out, out of the, the sojourner's employ or instruction. And brother, and it could be any relative, it says either his uncle or uncle's son may redeem him or any that is close of kin to him or his family may redeem him. Or if he be able, he can redeem himself. So, in verse 50, and he shall reckon with him that brought him from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee, and the price of his sale should be according to the number of years. According to the time of a hired servant shall be with him. So, if you're, if you're a, a servant and you got five years left of your servanthood, and the year of Jubilee is three years, well, now you're only worth two years worth, okay? And if there be yet many years behind, according unto him, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. So if there's a lot of years, it's worth more. If there remain but few years under the year of Jubilee, he shall count with him. According unto his years, shall he give him again the price of his redemption. And as a yearly hired servant shall be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in sight. So if you have less number of years, you're supposed to treat him like a hired servant. He's not paying off a debt anymore. Now he's simply being treated like, like an employee, employee. Verse 54, and if he shall not be redeemed in these years, then he shall go out into the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God is saying that he owns the people. And of course, as Christians, we're told we are nothing but unprofitable servants too. If we, if we live a perfect life, a perfect Christian, we do all the right things and we do all the things God tells us to do and we go out and um, preach the gospel and save souls and, and do all our tithing and serve the church and do everything we're supposed to do. One of God's views on that is, well, you're just an unprofitable servant. I forget the verse reference but he's saying that if you do all the right things well that's what you're supposed to do anyway you don't get rewarded for doing the right things now we know that that that's a mindset that god also says that there are there are rewards for all of us for um for showing grace we have it's going to be an entire beam of seat filled with rewards for for um from god for following him but even those rewards are going to be grace rewards because God could say, you did your job, good job, welcome to heaven, and that's that. But he chooses to give us rewards above and beyond. So I want to point out a couple of thoughts before this. <clears throat> Number one, we have no record of the Jewish people ever keeping the Jubilee year. None. They did not do it. But what's sadder is that for the most part, they never really kept the Sabbath years either. Uh, Second Chronicles 36, 2021 says, this is a, talking about Jeremiah's prophet. I mean, this is talking about the prophecy that Babylon's gonna come and, and punish Israel if they don't get right. And it says, and then that escaped from the sword carried him he away to Babylon. I'm sorry, Second Chronicles 36. This is describing what happened. This is what's happening to Israelites when Babylon captured 
and took. This is a fulfillment of the prophecies of Jeremiah. For there were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord. This is saying that Babylon captured Israel and took it away. Why? Verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land has enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years. Jeremiah, that's the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. He said that Babylon's going to come and they're going to take you away for 70 years. Part of that punishment was you weren't keeping the Sabbath years. God is saying, you didn't give me your Sabbath years. And now you've done it for so long, you owe me 70 years. Okay, the Sabbath years, one year every seven. And if you count them up, you can do the math, you realize that they hadn't been doing their Sabbath years. And God says, I'm going to get my 70 years one way or the other. You owe me 70 and the land lay barren, un unworked for 70 years. Uh, this is this is the principle. I've heard of stories of that with tithing too. I know of someone that's a farmer that said, I'm not tithing, I don't tithe. And um, at the end of his life, someone counted up all the times that his crops had failed or flooded out or got damaged. And they said, you know what? You lost about 10% of your crops during your life. You know, God got his tithe. Um, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And grace, of course, gives us the privilege of taking advantage of these, these promises. Now, the Sabbath was a sign for the Jew. But once again, giving God what is God's and giving it to him first is the best way to succeed, the best way to prosper, the best way to know that God's going to care for you. You give him his. The Sabbath was a sign for the Jew. We know that as a Christian, our Sabbath is Jesus Christ, and we enter into his rest. And for us, the Sabbath means that everything belongs to God. During the six years that, that I work, during the six days that I work, I'm working for God at that time, too. Everything is a Sabbath for us. Everything we do is for outreach. Everything we do is for the kingdom. There's no days off. There's no vacation in the kingdom of God. Fortunately for us, when we're on vacation, we're still working for the kingdom of God. We're still open to opportunities. The purpose of the Sabbath instruction here is to let us keep our mind focused on our dependency on God. We need God. The purpose for the Sabbath and the Jubilee was to set the prisoners free. And Isaiah 61 is exactly what Jesus quoted. Time to set the prisoner free. And he was declaring that. And he was declaring that because he is our Sabbath rest. So as we finish up Leviticus, which we'll probably do either next week or the week after, this is the end of the year. I'm going to be saying Happy New Year real soon. A new year is a time when the world likes to make um, promises, right? Make vows, make New Year's resolutions, right? And we know that in the flesh, we can make all the, resolu all the resolutions we want. And the joke, of course, is that the flesh is weak. Let's skip the resolutions. Let's just rest in our Sabbath rest. Let's just rest in what Christ has done for us. Let's rest in his love. That's where he rests, right? You rest in his love. We rest in his love. And when we do that, we find that the law is written in our hearts. The law is in our heart. And as a result, we want to help the poor. We want to bless others. We want to restore that which Satan has stolen. Our jubilee and the jubilee of the coming kingdom is that everything will be restored to God. This is God's planet. Adam sold it and gave it away to Satan, but the year of Jubilee is coming. When that happens, everything goes back to God. It's already been purchased, paid for on the cross. It's purchased. The rightful owner is in place. The rightful owner is en route. The rightful owner is going to show up, 
<clears throat> and after the tribulation, it's going to show up and say, what's mine is mine, and I'm taking it back. And all of creation will rejoice. Because right now, all of creation is groaning. And we can see it groan every day. Growing on the, watching the news, watching the environment, watching, watching this society. Creation is groaning because its owner is, is coming soon. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for our jubilee, the fact that the prisoner is now set free and we are now free to come home. We are now free to go to the land that we've been promised. And we just thank you so much for this. God, we praise you for this time. We pray that it be a blessing to those that are listening. And just uh, bless us in the coming days. Bless this coming year. God, we have no clue what the future holds, but we know you hold the future. And we know that this coming year will be an opportunity to demonstrate your care, your love, and your gospel to the world. And the darker it may get, the brighter we will shine. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John, that's what Aunt Grandma Seva used to say when we talked to her. We don't know what the future holds, but we know it holds the future. Right, yeah. She, she says that almost every time we talk to her. Yeah. That's my grandma. And of well, course, you're recording your grandma Ruby quite a bit tonight, too. Yeah. So you've got two grandmas at your quality. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got pretty good genes that God blessed me with. I have grandparents that, in their own way, remain missionaries for their whole life. So they sure did. What was that verse in uh, Second Chronicles thirty-six? I didn't well, find it. I found 20, Second Chronicles thirty-six, but twenty to twenty-one. Page twenty-one. You said twenty to twenty-one. If I wrote it down right, this is what I. Yes. What I typed out when I was putting my notes together. I have been known to make typos. <laughs> yeah, 2021. Yeah. This is um, Jeremiah 25, 11 and Jeremiah 29, 10 are the prophecies that this refers to. And it just, I mean, it answers the question, why 70 years? Well, there's a lot of other reasons for that. And of course, that's what Daniel read when he realized that if he, if he prayed and repented, God would allow the people to go back. But that 70 years comes from the fact that they had had, I can't do the math quick in my head, but yeah. X number of I years heard, that they had yeah. been ignoring, ignoring and not giving the Sabbath land its rest. And, you know, God's. Yeah. You know, I've heard that before, but I never had the scriptures to go with it. But right. That would be great well, it's actually 77 years on that because the Jews got back, were released seven years earlier. And where we get the other seven years is the tribulation. Well, let us clarify that. The 70 years, there's two sets of 70s. There's right. a 70 years that start with the desolation of Jerusalem, and that's called the, the desolation of kingdoms. That's a 70 year window that goes back, that continues on. And then there's a separate 70, the destruction of the temple. And that 70, the destruction of the temple is a 15 year later, 70. And what happened is Daniel by faith chose the first 70 to begin his prayer and God honored it. But in the rebuilding of the temple, you see in the book of Haggai, the people, because of so much oppression in rebuilding the temple, they start to question. They say, maybe we started too early. Maybe we should have waited till the second 70 are over. And of course, Haggai's message is, no, the oppression and suffering you're, you're encountering is because you're not building the temple, not because you're supposed to wait, get the temple built. Our, our final seven years of the tribulation are the last week. Again, another Sabbath, another week. Right. Daniel's 
uh, 70 weeks, which got interrupted at the, at the crucifixion of Christ, got interrupted by the rejection of his kingship when he arrived at the end of the 69th week. So, John, you, you know the uh, uh, Handel's Messiah? Mm -hmm. Well, George Frederick Handel, he kind of, uh, um, he used this principle of paying the debt of uh, others that couldn't pay their debt. Yes, yes. When the king had commissioned him to write the Messiah, and he did a masterful job of bringing out Christ in the scriptures, he took the money from uh, the concerts and he went and paid the debt of the people that were in the Tower of London so that they could go free. Right. So he, he must have had such a, a great grasp of the scriptures that for him to take that money and to use it for, you know, as God told him he 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 could do, you know, and help others get out of debt. So that's he one wrote, thing. That, from, he wrote uh, several uh, chorales or um, I forget chorale. like um, anthems. He wrote anthems. He would write the anthem to dedicate it to like a boys' school or a seminary, okay. something like that. And that would be their song. But then he was signing over all the royalties to it. So as anthems brought in money, those schools would get money for singing their own anthem or for other people performing it. So yeah, he was a huge philanthropist. He, um, when he came to England, uh -huh. he was he was German, and he oh. came in and he was, you know, he was hired to write some oratorios, and the local British composers didn't like him. And they assigned him this nasty rundown uh, auditorium, a concert hall, which uh -huh. was actually in a bad part of town. And historically, it was a part of town that was just crime ridden. You know, people okay. break into people's apartment houses and rob them of their furniture in daylight. It was really bad. Wow. And he he spent money to set up uh, gas lights, you know, lamps in the streets. Okay. And his concerts were so well attended that uh -huh. the community, outside communities came in to clean up the neighborhoods, put in safety that? features, hire security to make sure it was safe to get to the concerts. And as a result, he became known wow. as a person that revitalized neighborhoods. That's amazing. That's uh, Thank you for sharing that part. Yeah. But, a little uh, music yeah. history. <laughs> yeah, yes, very, very is, godly yeah. man. He remained a bachelor his whole life, but was very dedicated to God and dedicated yeah. to um, the, the serving the church and, um, and to evangelism. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, he came to mind when, when you were bringing this out in 24 and 25 of Leviticus a little bit. He, he used that principle. So. And again, you, you follow God and you say, this doesn't make any sense in earthly thinking. But God says, if you're going to trust me, I'm going to honor it. And of course, that's part of the glory God gets. Right. Trust you know, one part of our job, I always say, is to make God look good. Well, if God's bailing me out when I trust him, that makes him look good. Right, right. When, when we go out on, uh, on Saturdays, um, uh, sometimes uh, there's a certain pastor who, who will give some money to the poor. <laughs> and he brought out a, a verse to me that I wasn't aware of, which says that, he that lends to the poor lends to God. So mm -hmm. uh, that brought it brought that uh, verse to light to me. You know that uh, we we can help the the, the less fortunate by uh, you know giving them a, a little money here and there at times. You know. Well, that was one of Jesus's uh, uh, parables that he did on there about giving to a stranger. He did do this to me on there. Right, yeah, when, when you visited the poor, when you visited the shut-in, when you helped the poor, right, help the poor. Um, and of course, we're always, I mean, we're taught, we don't think about it too often, but you never know when you um, are ministering to an angel. Sure. So I'm not quite sure why they are ministering to, but we're told that to be conscious of the fact it could happen. And, right. um, um, it's, it's, it's such a it's a complete mystery to think about how part of God's program is His program for angels. They're in school too. 
they're trying to learn the things of God and they have yeah. entire, you know, curriculums that they're going through. Part of which wow. is look at that and try to understand grace, which you never needed. Um, so the, 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 you know, the entire God's program of education for his angels is, we don't know. We know it's there. We can see indications of it as they try to right. figure out what's going on. And Danny will see some of it going on. Right. It's a fun thing to contemplate. I, I was thinking of uh, the first and second commandment, you know, to love the Lord your God, but then to love your neighbor as yourself, you know, also in these matters. Yeah, it's, you have the transition from vengeance to justice to grace. Huh. Vengeance is what humans practice on their own. This is what humans today do. That's what everybody wants. It is our human nature to make sure that if someone hurts me, I must hurt them worse. And there's logic to that, right? right. If, you be, if, you, if you hurt me and I come back and hurt you worse, maybe you'll think twice about hurting me. But that's vengeance taking the law into my own hands. Now, if God chooses to do that, you can see he does that. And in fact, he will do that. That's what the tribulation period is all about. Vengeance mm -hmm. is mine. I'm going to eat grapes of wrath. It's serious stuff. But it's not well, our place to do that because as fellow sinners, I do not have the authority to pass out a judgment above and beyond that which has been done to me. Uh, Matthew 5.38. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If a man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, give him thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asks, and from him you should borrow thee, and turn not away. Love thy neighbor, hate thy enemies. I say, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do too good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use your persecutor. You know, he says, if you love them that love you, what, what benefit is that? You know, even publicans, even, even lawyers love people that love, love them. That means nothing. This is, this is pure grace. This is something that all of us are going to learn how to do. Uh -huh. Again, the law of eye for an eye, what, eye for an eye was not you must do eye for an eye. There was a limit, right? And these laws, these instructions for us, these are goals that we have as we're led to do. Mm -hmm. um, we're led by the Holy Spirit, ideally. And right. situation because someone punches me, right? I submit to the Holy Spirit and wait to see what he has to say about it. Sometimes he will say, take the blow for the gospel's sake, take the blow for my sake. Take the blow for this. Other times he'll say, you know, you need to punch back to protect your family. Right. It's not, right. these are things that we're, you know, we need to be in a position <laughs> where if God does show up and say, sell all that you have and give to the poor, that we say, whatever you say. He's right. not asked us, everyone, to do that. We don't apply the instruction that he gave to one man to everybody. That would again be legalistic. Sure. Um, we, we apply these things as, as God gives us. But this is the heart of God. The right. heart of God is to demonstrate who he is by grace, not wow. by law. But he had to show who he was in law first so we can appreciate grace. Huh. It's, it's the contrast so, principle there. You said vengeance, something else, and grace. What was the middle? Justice. One? Justice, thank you. Yeah. Vengeance is how the world operates. Justice is the proper balance, and grace ultimately has how God wishes for us to operate. And grace is grace and submission is how God gets things done. Huh. That's how we. That's how the gospel is spread. That's how. Um, that's how we. That's how we demonstrate God to others. If if I only love the people that love me, and I fight back, and I just live in. I can live in perfect justice, but the world's not going to look at me like I'm strange. They're going to look at me like that's the right way to do things. I can't be a testimony doing that. Right? No one's going to say, what makes you special? No one's going to say, how can you handle that? How can you get by with that? 
But when we practice grace, the world goes, you're crazy. How can you do that? How can you let them get away with that? You know, how can you still be happy after what they did to you? Sure. That's the testimony. And that's the opportunity we have. Yeah, it's like when Peter uh, denied the Lord three times. It, Jesus didn't take vengeance on him, but he gave him grace and forgiveness. Yeah, vengeance would have been crazy. But even justice yeah. would have been, okay, you ignore me, I'm ignoring you now. Yeah, that'd be fair. I like giving the example. Uh, I gave this to my students. I said, let's say a cop killed somebody, which has happened, and it was totally not justified. It's wicked. It's evil. Terrible. If we were to pursue justice, what is the limit of the punishment? The cop dies, right? That's the limit of the punishment. That would be appropriate. What would vengeance be? Uh, kill all the cops. Vengeance would be destroy his family. Vengeance would be destroy the industry or the institution. And, and that's where the world loses it. And that's where society can break down. Wow. And, and so why? That's why you look at these rules and the surrounding countries were supposed to watch Israel and go, oh, that's what a civilized society does. They protect women. Oh, they protect servants. They have limits to how badly you can punish somebody. Huh. And uh, you cannot you cannot find the concept of human rights or human dignity outside the Bible. Hmm. You don't find it in the laws of Hammurabi or Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar. They, the idea of human rights is a nonsense concept. It's only in the Judeo-Christian worldview right. Do we have the idea that a fellow human being is also made in the image of God and is an equal? My mother-in-law, one of her, my favorite comments, she said, Jesus came so that the slave, so slaves, children, and women would no longer be second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. People like to attack the Bible and say in this anti-woman. And I always, in my class, I say, well, there's this verse in the Bible that says, wives submit to your husband. And I ask the question, why does that verse offend us? And the answer is because as a culture, we came to think that women and men are equal. And of course, you take that verse in context, men have to submit to their husband and we all must submit to each other. It's a lesson of submission. And as a Christian and in a relationship, our goal as Christians is to try to be the first to submit. It's, it's a different lesson entirely. But that question is, where did we get this crazy idea that men and women are equal in the first place? And the answer is, because of our Christian heritage. The idea that men and women are equal did not come from any place other than the fact we have a Christian worldview in our cultural history. Wow, yes. When, when, Paul, when people read Paul's letters and they read, wives submit to your husband, that culture would have said, well, duh, of course. And then when it said, husbands submit to your wives, love your wives, they would have been outraged and, and confounded by that. They would have said, wait a minute, this is crazy. I like pointing out the reason our culture says wives make your husband is a crazy verse is because our culture doesn't believe in inequality, but it only, it's only because our culture has a biblical history. Otherwise we wouldn't have that reaction. Uh -huh. I have a, a quick question. You didn't mention when you said that people were punished about the cities of refuge. Was that brought in later or was that was that there in that time? Oh, that's definitely later. Okay. Cities are, are mentioned. They, they say they're going to be, and that's earlier on in Leviticus, but um, the, the real instructions for that, I'm pretty sure the details are later on. Okay. Um, I'd have to look. We didn't, I don't remember covering the details. I remember we talked about them. But that's. It's always interested me that there was hope for people who weren't guilty. So I know we did cover, the, I don't know if it's, we talked about it, whether I was talking about Leviticus that we were, that we were covering, or I was re referring elsewhere in the, in the Bible. But um, 
the thing we did mention is that the city of refuge meant that a person could um, could run to the judges of that city and the judges had the right to say this crime was not intentional this crime was um yeah. and so the 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 judge of the city could give them refuge and the point i like to make is that that refuge status that um freedom from execution lasted only until the high priest died mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we pointed out that jesus christ on the cross said they don't know what they do which was his judgment on sinners saying that our sin was not um intentional jesus declares that the sins of humanity have been declared accidental in a levitical sense in a judicial sense in other words it's not premeditated it's uh, manslaughter mm -hmm. by his declaration that entitles us to enter into the city of refuge and jesus christ is our city of refuge and that city of refuge gives us guaranteed total immunity from prosecution until the high priest dies so fortunately for us our high priest will never die but that is why the bible says that jesus ever liveth to make intercession jesus is going to be functioning as an interceder for all eternity it's a strange yeah. verse if you think, well, why don't the intercession in year five billion and one, right? But the well, answer is he's functioning as an intercessor because he is performing the role of high priest, guaranteeing wow. my um, my sanctuary in heaven. Wow. wow. Thank you. He saves us to the uttermost, no? He sure does. Yep. Pretty much covers that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uttermostest. Thank you. And the reason for that, he was completely pure. I want to go back a little bit. When I first came on, you were talking about the gifts to the baby Jesus on there with mm -hmm. the gold, like and myrrh. Um, one of the reasons that gold was given was gold was considered pure. Right. On there. So therefore, Jesus was pure. Right. Fragrances was basically the incense that the high priest did for their rituals, things like that there. Mm -hmm. on that so being a high priest he would have to have the frequencies to perform those rituals okay yeah. and of course the embalming he was embalmed with mirror on that on there yeah. so those are the great focuses on that yeah, yeah thanks yeah that's absolutely true in the millennial reign people are going to be, be bringing gifts to christ as well and those gifts are going to be gold and frankincense no myrrh <laughs> no myrrh and that's they, over with. And fragrance is, what, is a, like a sap or whatever. I don't know what kind of a tree it was, but it was a mm -hmm. type of tree that it comes from dried and then maybe mixed with some um, olive oil on yeah. there. It's very so. expensive. Yeah. Right. It's, it's one reason we know that the, the Magi came later because had they come earlier, Mary would not have needed to use turtle doves for her, um, um, mm -hmm. for her purification. We'd have been able to buy the nicest. Well, they came about two, <clears throat> almost two years from right. his actual birth on there. That's yeah. why he had, he had said, kill any boy under two years of old, because he would have yeah. been a year and a half to two years at the time. So they needed that to go to Egypt. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like we pointed out, that they were able to travel and probably live very well in in hiding for those two right. years i mean for God provided for them that's yeah, for sure. until until they came back to, to israel so i think it's interesting though we talk about egypt being a type of sin and yet god protected jesus or jesus was protected in egypt during mm -hmm. that time like absolutely totally. There's there's a deeper significance there, I think, than what most of us realize. Mm -hmm. kind like was, a, it's kind of like the idea of black is supposed to be represent sin, and yet sometimes uh, it's it has other meanings too. So you have to go in context right. when you see the things. Yeah, being called out of Egypt, it's just one area where the life of Joseph and Jesus parallel too. 
I mean, both Joseph and Jesus, they were sold by their family to the Gentiles. Right. And, and, and to be persecuted. And then they, right. they rose above it. So it's a lot of amazing. But the whole Bible is so holographic. <laughs> every story applies to every other story. And obviously, we could spend the next several years just having one story lead to another story. Yes. Yep. But it's so hard sure to quit reading. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there are certain books. The Book of Hebrews is a book that I cannot read before I go to sleep because I'll never go to sleep. <laughs> Put it down. Nope. Keep John, adre- too much adrenaline on that book. Yeah. When I, I made a comment one time as a Gideon to Tracy and to the family here that I made a list of the different Bible verses that what came out as, as the means that a person led to the Lord. And most of them were not necessarily salvation verses. And Tracy, as a junior higher, had the insight to say, but dad, if they just follow those verses in the in, in the concordance or whatever, it will lead to that. Right. So, mm-hmm. That's a pretty good insight. Yeah, most, most word searches lead to Jesus. <clears throat> Or as C.S. Lewis once said, he says, not only is Jesus the answer to every question, once you've got the answer, the question no longer matters. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So, John, one last quick question. Uh, the Magi, were they the only ones uh, in, in Babylon that had the right to recognize a... Uh, a king for who he was, like Jesus was a king. So they came and they, they uh, by the time at the by the time Jesus was born, the Magi as a as a guild was of course hired by kings to be advisors. One of the Magi's jobs is to install new kings. Okay, they, they were known for that, and so you know, if 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 a, if a new prince is getting ready to be called installed as king, they would call on the magi to do a ceremony to, to okay. do advice and you know different mystical stuff. I mean, I'm not going to say they were in any way right. believers or Christians, but their scriptures had incorporated so much of the Bible by that time that magi came. They were. I, I can definitively say the Magi came to Israel expecting to find the new king and planning to offer their services to install him properly. I see. And they That's were shocked. Right. And they the were shocked when Israel didn't know who the king was and didn't seem to care. <laughs> you know, it struck me, John, that they came to, to install this new king, and yet they recognized the new king in the baby. Absolutely. Wow. Well, remember, God honored their faith by giving them the star when they left um, Herod's palace. Right. So it's like, well, if these people don't know where the king is and if their scribes aren't going to help me, and if they expected to find the whole country celebrating and knowing who their king was, I mean, they, I can imagine them, you know, five miles from Jerusalem going, where's the fireworks? <laughs> It's like they're, we're, they're, they're, you know, they should be they should be just going crazy because their Messiah has come, and when it's all crickets, they're very disillusioned, and then they see that people think we're here to invade them. Herod's a jerk; he doesn't know anything. These scribes they dig through their dusty scrolls and find the name Bethlehem, and so we're going to head that direction, but they're not interested in following us to find out or helping us. You know, Herod himself says, "Well, if you find something, let me know." very disillusioned so that's why it says they rejoiced when they saw the star uh, mm-hmm. they said, well they well, had enough scripture from the Babel, uh the years that the hebrews were in babylon right we can be sure that those hebrews shared those scriptures right and yeah. somehow we call them wise men because they put put that together to be well, able to recognize king james calls them wise men but they are magi. Magi is a category of people. It's an organization, just like the magi organization, just like the UN's organization or the Boy Scouts organization. They were members of that organization. Right. 
like but those, fear of a high those Hebrews had infiltrated their teachings Absolutely. into Babylon. Yeah, I'm still going to find that for a steward because I had some of the Zoroastrian scriptures. I'm going to look them up. Um, what they didn't have was Micah. Micah would have told them Bethlehem. So they were coming expecting the latest news. My point is when they came out and saw the star, they were rejoicing. They says, well, if those people can't help us find the Messiah, God himself is going to do it. So the Shekinah right. glory yeah. shows up and leads them to the house. Michael. At which point they walk in and, you know, the attestation of the Holy Spirit at that point says, you found him. And it says they worship him. Right. Always just breaks me. And what's funny, what's funny is they weren't just from the Babylonian area. They were actually further, they came from further east than, than that there too, down to where mm -hmm. India and China was. They kind of combined and came up. And there was always more than just three. Yeah, well, we, are, yeah, we talked about, a lot about that. It's probably a minimum of 20, probably 20 to 50. At a minimum. Caravan of probably over 200 of security and servants and mm -hmm. cooks and, and probably a whole... Um, diplomatic regiment to indicate that this is a diplomatic mission, not an invasion, a bunch of white flags, the whole thing. That's why it says all of Jerusalem was troubled. So. Imagine Mary and Joseph and what they must have thought when they saw all those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, wow. And of course, Mar Mary, knew, Mary knew exactly who her son was, but like she asked the angel, how is this going to work out? She was always curious as to how it was going to be fulfilled. And, and she watched it with perfect faith. But of course, Simeon told her the heart would pierce her soul. And it did, you yeah. know, in two yeah. ways. She watched her son kill. And I heard a wonderful message from a Catholic priest who was doing his best to be biblical. And he said, he said, the other thing that pierces Mary's soul today is watching people pray to her and not her son. Yep. He was, he was renouncing wow. that whole um, added stuff. I mean, it's, it's really recent, this whole enunciation of Mary and sinlessness of Mary. That's a very recent thing, historically. He was just saying, he said, that's got to hurt her too. Yeah, John, when, when we were um, doing vacation Bible school, at our church, the Catholic Church came over to see our science, our science dome, because they were going to do the same the same uh, vacation Bible school program, and they were going to build one like the one we had at our church. Whoa. And instead, they invited us to come over and do the science program. So <laughs> the guy who did the science program at our church, and you know, I helped him out those five days. Well, the priest came once. And when we all got done, he said, why didn't you tell the kids to read their Bible and pray to Jesus? Because he said, the one thing that people don't do is pray to Jesus like they should and read their Bibles. But you're Protestants, you should be telling them that. And we were trying to be respectful of Catholicism and not, you know, go too far. We went quite a ways, but we didn't go too far. And he happened to be there, so we were less um, forthright. <laughs> and so that was pretty interesting that he was there to tell us, "You guys should have gone farther." Yeah. Well, I've I've been involved in lots of Catholic churches in America. If the Pope knew what was going on, he'd be really upset. I've been to Catholic churches where they store chairs in the confessionals. The priest was saying, "You don't." tell me your sins you tell them to god um yeah they're they've given up a lot of that babylonian stuff in a lot of american churches mm -hmm. and it's because it's because you know your christian media just covers so much and i i enjoy sometimes watching some catholic shows um they try to if, the only problem i really have with catholicism is that a lot of it's excessive structure is really more of a going back to judaism than anything else they're trying to reinstitute the law in a lot of ways wow. you need a, a, a human mediator where you have to um you know i mean official catholic dogma is salvation by faith through grace in jesus christ 
grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the statement they make. And they believe it. The problem is, is they say, and once you've been saved, you now have the privilege of maintaining it with these um, ordinances and these sacraments. And so it's, it's the main maintenance of salvation by works that is the real problem with most Catholics. But I think the sad thing about most Catholics is that they are saved, but they're not allowed to believe it's, it's permanent. But the, uh, the assurance of salvation is still upheld to be anathema, that phrase, assurance of salvation. I heard a call in fellow to a Christian station. He was a Catholic and he was called in and he was questioning purgatory. And the question basis, but when Jesus was on the cross, there was no mention of purgatory to the thief. I'll see you in paradise. So, so where do we get purgatory? With the Catholic questioning. Well, I once heard this same Catholic priest say, it's about time we look in our Bible to see what purgatory really is. And he went through and he gave the entire doctrine of the Bema Seat, saying, the closest thing to purgatory in the Bible is when people who are already on their way to heaven have been totally forgiven and they're guaranteed in heaven, their, their bad deeds, their loss of rewards, their wood, hay, and stubble are burned away. He said, that's the closest thing I can find in the Bible of purgatory. So, and he, he basically said, that's purgatory. Which, of course, has nothing to do with medieval purgatory, but it was his attempt to try to reconcile and get people in their Bible and get a proper biblical view of the subject. Hey, John, you, you were saying Malachi, did you? No, mean, no, 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 no. Never mind. Never mind. Micah. Oh, Micah, yeah. If I said Malachi, I meant Micah. Okay. No, it was uh, the, confusion, it, the confusion at my house. In your brain. In my brain when I was relating your message from a couple Saturdays ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Micah would be Bethlehem. Malachi would be the promise of a prophet before the Messiah. So. Right. Excellent study, John. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, it was a little crazy here. I was kind of... Put some notes together and stuff, and I suddenly realized it was 6.57 my time. <laughs> so I hadn't, printed, I hadn't even printed these little notes out yet. I hit the printer, I went on, and then when I started the meeting, my camera wasn't working. So I actually I grabbed my other, other laptop, which is nearby. I'll figure out the camera thing later. I prefer the laptop because it's uh, hardwired. This is wireless only, but with my new internet, I haven't, I've been okay. Well, and John, I, I, I should have said something. I noticed the little recording thing wasn't in the corner and I should have stopped you right away, but I didn't. No, didn't okay, think thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I didn't miss too much. I did a little 20 second recap after I hit the record. So thanks. Well, hey, anyway, thanks so much. We had a nice crowd for uh, the Monday after Christmas. Uh, we'll get together next Monday as well. We're going to be... Uh, Monday after New Year's. Start, start a new year. Yeah, start a new year. I haven't looked to see whether I'll be finishing Leviticus or not. Depends on what we combine. I just thought tonight, the, the Sabbath year in Jubilee is a beautiful premise, but I, I couldn't take a whole hour on just that. And the previous chapter is clarifying oil and bread and the, the half breed, <laughs> yeah, the, you know, and the, you know, you have to look at. I always ask a question: Why is this in the Bible? You know, and this in the Bible to say, this is a problem. And of course, there was a lot of problem with the, the, non-Jewish, the mixed multitudes that came in later. Most of the dissension came from people that were not Jewish. And of course, they're expected to treat them with the same respect and the same love and they all abide by the same rules. But um, those Gentile leavens, they, they come in and can still cause problems sometimes. So anyway, let's go ahead and close with some prayer. Uh, Stuart, can you close with a prayer, please? Yes. Lord, we want to thank you for the study tonight. The going through the Jubilee years, it's such a tragedy that the Israelites never followed through on those years. 
And we yeah. ask that you help us to follow through on, on the jubilees that you leave for us, the, the mm -hmm. things that we need to do to refresh ourselves, refresh our churches and our communities. We ask that you lead us down those paths. In thy name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, thanks so much, everybody. Thank God you. bless. Yes. Happy New Year. Happy New yeah. Year, everybody. Next time. Good night, okay. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Happy New Good night. Year. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.